Hello. Hi, Tom. How are you doing? Okay. All righty. Now, just to practice again, on share, okay. share screen, share computer sound, optimize screen for video clip. Ah, right. There we are, I think. Okay. There. Yep, there it is. Okay. I have a couple of things to ask you. Sure. First of all, would you mind having sometime during the class having Marcia take a picture of you teaching the class on Zoom? Uh, and then email it to me. Yeah, hold <laughs> on. Like yes. Put it in my presentation. I'm sorry. Yes, we, we can do that. Yeah, I'd like to put that in my presentation for the conference. I'm talking about what we're doing during the pandemic. And I have one picture, and I'd like to put one of your class. I have one picture of somebody taking my class. Okay. So. Good. Okay, that sounds good. Or you can have her take a couple and send them, you know, or pick out which one you like, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Make sure you look good. All right, <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I don't know, can you see me at all or not? No, I can only see your picture, a still photo of you. All right. See? Uh, oh, you don't have a picture of me? How come I'm? You're a still photo. I see you, but it's not live. I'm about to start video. I there you are now. Okay, now I see you. I don't know if you can see this. Whoops. The other thing I oh. want to ask you. <laughs> yeah, oh, wait, I don't want to. Don't show the production. <laughs> At least you have shorts on. <laughs> hey, hey. Yeah. Um, I, have, I have shorts on, too. Anyway, um. The other thing I want to ask you is, would you mind giving a little background about yourself to the participants? Oh, um, sure. You know, like how you know about China. I know you worked in Hong yeah. Kong, but I, I don't feel comfortable introducing you with because I don't remember all your stuff. So, okay. yeah, I can do that. What you did. Okay, that would be great. Good. Um, Okay, so just those two things was what I was going to ask you. And then I'll do my little um, intro, you know, thing like I usually do, tell them about the upcoming classes and if they want to make a donation. Now, let me, just, let me just practice something. If I start off where they see me, then I go to share screen. And now they'll see the screen? Yeah, and then I just see you on this little little thing of you on the right. side and we'll go stop screen now and i'll just go right start and off. then i can see you and okay. sure. yeah so we're good i'm going to look at the waiting room and start the only problem i have with the camera is it moves the opposite way you move uh, yeah it drives me nuts because i feel like i'm leaning this way all the time and, and <laughs> i don't know but yeah sure if that's the case, I'll set up some nice pictures here that you can see. Uh. Okay. There we are. I'm just taking attendance. No problem. Let me see here. These two are the ones that I just submitted for the uh, potpourri. Oh, they're, I was hoping uh, you submitted some things for that. Yeah, they're drawings, and uh, they're uh, basically they're uh, charcoals. Oh, very nice. And so, yeah. but when you give a background for yourself, make sure you tell them you're an artist too. Yeah, so, well, I'll yeah. Do it right from here, they should see me, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're like a Renaissance man. You know, you have all these talents. No, I don't think so. <laughs> My wife would tell you I'm a crotchety uh, renaissance. <laughs> That's something else. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I never thought I'd use a term like that to apply to me. Uh, oh, I know. We all are getting that way now. Yeah. Oh, we're, we're not young anymore. Let's see. That's that's not good, is it? 
Yeah. Well, that, that'll work for the beginning, and I'll turn it out of the way. Yeah, right. Yeah. And just get good, have good lighting for when she takes your picture. Yeah. Yeah. Let me let me have her do something like that. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm going to set the screen up. Marsha's not here right now, but David is. He's oh, that's fine. Up this stuff for the masters, and the, 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 oh, it's as good to be home as anywhere else. So oh, let me yeah. do this, David. I'm going to share the screen, and I'm going to put this thing up, and I want you to take the picture uh, as if I'm teaching. So can you take, you need to get the screen in. Okay. That screen. That screen. Okay. Okay. Can you do that? I probably, I might need to get over here to do that. Because I, do you want both screens in the shop? No, just yeah. the one screen. Then I probably need to get over here. Go ahead. Go ahead. Move this stuff out of the way. Yeah. How's that? I figure we'll get it while, before we start, it's easier. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Just pretend. Can you, <laughs> Can you get that without yeah, the... Yeah, that light needs to be off. Or at least, yeah. How's that? Yeah. And you got me in, in teaching, yeah. Let's, let's pick a good slide. That's a nice one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on. Do you um, like it? I think it's good because it shows me at the computer teaching. Okay, fine. Oh. Then just email it to me. That'll be fine. Thank you, David. If you Thank still you, David. no problem, uh, just come and get me when you're done. Yeah. Uh, and I can transfer these pictures to you. Okay. Thank you very much. David. No problem. Put this stuff back. And go back to this. And that'll work for you. Yeah. How's that? I'm right from this this kind of posture. Do you see me? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. What else you need? <laughs> That's it. Just those two things. Just tell them about yourself a little bit. All right. <laughs> yeah, that'd be good. Do a bio. All right. Yeah. That's easy. Well, I, at least we're doing something. Morning. Yeah, I know. Keep this keeps us keeps us busy. <laughs> yeah, well, you know this thing. I mean, I bet you it was probably oh, easily over a hundred hours of research. Just to wow. Get well, there. tell them that too. Tell uh, them. Nah, they, they yeah. don't know that. Well, you I mean uh, yeah? They can't suppose that by seeing that every damn slide and everything on every slide is footnoted. Yeah. You know, I mean, that doesn't just happen. Yeah. Uh, but if, you know, it comes from teaching and it also comes from being in the bureau. I mean, when you present a case, you better have everything completely documented because the, the defense attorney will rip you to pieces if there's something yeah. not, you know. Yeah. It, it's so similar. That's what made teaching its college, I won't say easy, but familiar. The fact that you're doing the same darn thing you did in the bureau. Everything yeah. gets documented. Right, I mean, and then your opinions are based upon, uh, you know, the sum of what you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, in teaching, you can do that a little more than you can on the witness stand, obviously. But yeah. How you get to the witness stand is you use all that experience, and then it tells you where to look to find what you need to convict somebody. So, I mean, it's, it's you use it, you use your experience at a different spot. Because it shows you which way the investigation goes, but it's not wholly unlike teaching. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. much like it. Yeah. How are we doing then? How many people we got uh, signed up today? Oh, um, there's like 
40, I think, signed up for the class. Up, yeah. I know they all won't come. Yeah. No, I made my screen so I can fit up to 48 or something uh, yeah. pictures on it rather than half and half like last time where I had no idea who someone yeah. would start talking and I had to go screen to screen to figure out who it was. Yeah. Right. So that's good. And I mean, uh, oh, Christ, it's almost 1.30. Yep. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 26. We got four minutes. You're gonna, you're gonna want to say a few words before I start, too. Yeah, yes, I'm sorry. You're gonna want to say a few words before I start. Yes, I, I, I have to do my little ad for you know the classes upcoming what? and the and making donations because we're not charging for these, but we you know we don't have our revenues really gone down, so we need to you know ask well, people to make donations. One good thing is when you and I present, I mean, you're a uh, basically an expense they got one way or another and I'm free so yeah. we're not costing them anything extra to do the classes well no they are they, their revenue they depend on the revenue for the classes to so like pay our salaries and stuff oh really oh they got nice. they got actually the one of those um grants or loans to help pay us through June well that's um, cool. yeah so I mean we may have to cut our hours after that I don't know <laughs> yeah well I mean you know the it takes a lot of people to run that senior center and, and all the programs. I mean, it's incredible uh, the number yeah. it takes. And, and I haven't seen anybody there that looks like they're not working hard. Uh, yeah. Of course, I think part of that's your director. She's just sharp as a tack. Right. She keeps us on our toes. nice, too. I mean, yeah. usually when you get someone that's been in that long, yeah. Geez, you never She's know. She's really care. Everybody that works here really cares about the participants, yeah. and that's good. She's a really neat person. Caring. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Okay. Now we got 15 in the class. I'll wait another right before 1 30. I'll, I'll wait another minute before I start opening it. No problem. Yeah. You see us all. Can they hear us? No. Okay. No. That's good. <laughs> okay. By the time we get done, we'll have this uh, Zoom down to a science, then we won't be using it anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was talking to somebody yesterday, and we were saying we should have bought, everybody, we would have been rich if we had bought stock in this about uh, three months ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, who, who could have anticipated? It was, yeah. Things would turn out as they turned out. I mean, we're, we're real fortunate. Uh, most of us are in good shape and such, but. Yeah, no, there's but a lot of people. I've friends up in New Jersey where it's, you know, I mean, one of them had it, the coronavirus. And oh, my gosh. He had just had open heart surgery. Did he recover? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he did just fine. He said it wasn't that bad. He said it was like getting the flu for three days. But mm -hmm. uh, it apparently doesn't last all that long if you're healthy. And I guess yeah. he must have been reasonably healthy mm -hmm. or, or he wouldn't have made it. Uh, but I do notice every time I see him, he's sitting in a chair, not moving a whole lot. So I, mean, I have a feeling it took more out of him. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like it takes a lot out of him. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, you get you get to think for three days, and it takes you six weeks to get back to right. Normal problem. Okay, we have got twenty-two people now, so I think I'm going to start Go ahead. admitting them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oops, there's a couple more. Don't uh, man. Okay. All right. Okay, I'm starting to admit people. Mm -hmm. 
So you don't yeah, want tell me all this these, is going again. You, you don't want all these other pictures. Do you? I'm starting to admit people to the class. I'm, I'm still trying to take attendance. So uh, take a few minutes. There you go. <laughs> Hi. Oh. <laughs> Guess somebody's bad down. Yeah. Hello, Karen. All right. I think I, oh, there's another person. Okay, one of the things we want to ask you is to please mute yourselves um, because we get the background noise from everybody's house and uh, that can get quite loud um, with all the different things going on in people's homes and neighborhoods. So I think I've admitted everybody that I see in the waiting room right now um, and I'll be admitting some more. So good afternoon and thank you for joining us for our second week of China Now. Um, I wanted to mention a few uh, upcoming things that we have. Um, we have. In June, we have two upcoming classes and our, here's another person and another person. Um, yes. um, we, our upcoming classes in June are, uh, one is on, uh, uh, Florida history, Florida at the crossroads of empire, 1513 to 1821. And then we, and that starts on uh, June 4th. And that will be um, a four week class at 1.30 um, on, um, I believe that's on Thursdays. And then on Tuesdays, we have a three week class starting on June 16th. And that will be on Tuesdays, 1.30. And that is on Mars, the planet Mars. We are now doing online registration. So if you would like to register for either of those classes, please go on to our Tallahassee SeniorFoundation.org website. And you can cl uh, click on register uh, for virtual classes. And, um, and it, it's, it's right on there. And it should, it should, be, um, should be, there's also directions on there how to do it. It should be pretty easy. So TallahasseeSeniorFoundation.org to register for our classes. The other thing I wanted to mention is um, at this time, we're not charging for any of our online classes, um, but our, um, our classes and activities and our staff salaries, including mine, are funded by donations to our nonprofit senior foundation. Um, since the senior center has been closed, our revenue has been greatly reduced. We depend on the revenue from the classes. So we would appreciate any donations that you're able to make. Or if you're a member and um, you want to, um, you know, renew your membership early, that would also help. Or if you're not a member, you can become one. And um, all that information is also on TallahasseeSeniorFoundation.org. Or you can always mail us a check. We take those too. So thank you so much again for joining us this afternoon. And now my commercial is finished. And I'm going to turn it over to Tom Friedman, who will be our host today for the second week of China. So, um, get the sign in. And again, please, everybody, mute yourselves and unmute, your, unmute yourself if you have a question, but please mute yourselves. 
I've got to find Tom on here. To... Yeah, there's a couple people that are still not muted, so I'm trying to mute some people. Make sure you mute yourself. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Tom as the host. So again, thanks for coming, and I'll just be a participant in the class. And um, okay, there we go. The coast. Yes. All right, Tom, you're the host. Okay. Uh, can you all see me? No. Uh, hold on. Ed. Ah, hello. Uh, uh, somebody else's uh, name is on there. Can you see me now, folks? Yes? Okay. Um, a couple things. Uh, first of all, uh, I've been asked to give you a little bit of a bio so that you understand who I am and, and why it is I'm teaching this. Uh, I'm Tom Friedman. Uh, I spent uh, 20 years, 21 years in the FBI. And during that time, uh, I worked an awful lot of uh, cases that involved uh, China and Korea. Uh, I wound up being a unit chief at the FBI headquarters, where I handled most of the intelligence that we got from those countries. And so I spent most of my working life looking at China. Um, I worked uh, for a while as a legal attache in Hong Kong, which at that point was our uh, inroad into China, because at that time nobody was allowed to go into China. So that, that's, that's, that's why I'm teaching this. Uh, I found it most interesting over the years. When I got done with the Bureau, I uh, taught as a uh, adjunct professor at Florida State, uh, I taught criminal justice, and then I retired as a visiting professor at Florida A&M University, where I taught till I retired again. So I've got a little bit of experience in teaching. So what I want to do now, is that sufficient, Maureen? I think, okay, good. All right, what I want to do now is share the screen, and what we're going to do is we're going to go into the presentation, and Let's see, it should share it. And uh, you'll have to forgive me, I need to go, whoop, I need to go backwards because we did something else when we started. Okay, I'm going to also take the light out of my face, which is pretty awful. All right, uh, this is China now, it's week number two, and this is gonna be the uh, rise and fall of dynastic China. Not, act, not totally accurate because they, they were risen for couple thousand years before we're going to start talking. But today we're going to talk about the Ming Dynasty. That's those great phases that you've heard of. And the uh, Qing Dynasty, which was the Manchus who came down when the Ming Dynasty kind of fell apart. Last week we talked uh, a little bit about uh, philosophy. And I realize that, that's kind of a boring topic. But out of that, I tried to distill it to one slide. Confucius thought is the moral rule, respect for those who rule, elders and tradition. If somebody's got their mic on, turn it off, please. Good. Uh, Taoist philosophy is the way. You want to be one with nature, accept change in one's environment, cast out accepted wisdoms to find your own path. That was the group that said, hey, it's great to be uh, ignorant. Uh, and so they said, if you can find yourself being ignorant, do it. Uh, Mosian worldview, this with the uh, wandering uh, monks. Uh, egalitarian society based on a sense of mutual aid for the common good. Universal love and condemnation of lust for profit, luxury, the accumulation of wealth, and of war. So they were against all these things. The legalist dogma is the state's authority is paramount. Individuals must follow the laws, and you exist as an individual to serve the state. Finally, the art of war, and that's the strategies, the tactics that were used to defeat enemies and gain support of the people. So if you put those five things together, you've got the philosophical basis for everything that comes afterward. Remember, those things were basically set in stone by 200 BC. So China had its great age, probably three or 400 BC. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Here we go. Okay. Well, how did the Ming Dynasty begin? The Ming Dynasty replaced the Song Dynasty, which was the Mongols. The same Mongols who went into Europe 
wound up in Hungary and here and there, all over. Same Mongols also penetrated into China, the reason for the Great Wall, in fact. Uh, Hung Wu was the first emperor of the Ming Dynasty. And he is well known for one reason in particular, which carries forward. He was the first emperor in China who was born as a peasant. He got a group of folks together, they started fighting, and by the time he was done, he had the biggest army and he took over. Interesting person. On the right uh, is a bit of uh, pottery that uh, is Ming Dynasty. It's porcelain uh, with painted enamels over it. On a lot of these slides you're gonna see now that we're into history, I'll give you some of the pretty things that were created during the periods. Uh, next we have uh, what he did. Uh, first of all, the Mongols basically just exploited and exploited. And so what happened was the farmers were starving. Uh, a lot of people were starving. And so he did a number of things that were necessary for the good of the country. Hold on just one second. There. That's quieter now, huh? Um, between uh, 1370 and 1398, Massive irrigation along the Yangtze and the Yellow Rivers. Uh, it's been compared to what the PRC tried to do in 1949, a comparable situation. And uh, below it, we have a very, very nice lacquer. Uh, you, something that you put a plant in or whatever, that type of thing. Rice measure is what they call it. The thing that on this slide that's most significant is, in his era, they planted 1,000 million trees because the place had been basically denuded by the Mongols. It's an incredible number. How they did it was they required each family to do something. Families got together with, in groups and they just, you know, everybody did a little. And by the time they get done, they had just retreed the entire country. The Song Dynasty had based taxes primarily on commerce, which makes sense being that they were nomads who came in and took over. And uh, what did they do as nomads? They traded, they didn't farm. Now, under the Ming Dynasty, the payment of taxes fell upon the farmers, the peasant farmers. Um, it worked because of the fact they made it possible for the farmers to actually farm instead of having to worry about being raided every 10 minutes, okay? So from this point on in Chinese history, it's the peasants who are paying the taxes for the most part. And uh, here on the right, we have a dish with uh, two young kids, uh, 16th century, it's black lacquer, inlaid with mother of pearl, pretty neat. The way that the Ming sorted society out was rather interesting, and it relied on something that was basically very Chinese, and that is they initially required families to get together in groups. What they were doing, in essence, is almost relying on the clan structure that preexisted them, because families would live somewhat together, and so everybody would be related, you know, over several generations. Everybody had relatives. And so what they did was they got them all together and that's how they worked the taxes and the farming. Then as time went by, certain folks became gentry or and rich peasant farmers. And so now what happened was the small working landowners disappeared and they became tenant farmers, uh, which is not good. Uh, it's coupled with a civil service that was so small that they relied on these gentry to collect their taxes. So they almost created their own fuel system all over again. Some had existed before, but now it, it got futile again. Uh, on the left is a tray with uh, Taoist figures. Of course, what do you have? You have nature. The figures out in nature, because that's Taoism. They're finding themselves in nature. They were influenced by the Taoist notion that an autocrat was heavenly. 
This is how they interpreted it. I'm not sure most of the Taoists would have been thrilled, but that's how this dynasty interpreted it. And so this new emperor, Hong Wu, exalted his position. People had to kneel in his presence, and he didn't hesitate to have him beaten if they didn't do it right. Uh, but along with the Taoist type thought, they favored recruitment of officials from the lower classes, which didn't make the nobility particularly thrilled. Uh, in 1380, there was a show trial. Now, show trials are interesting because it's something that the Chinese have been doing a long time. Uh, think the Gang of Four at the end of the Cultural Revolution, and what you'd have is a show trial. Russians did it a lot too, obviously, during Stalin's era. So this Hu Wei Yong was the other big leader throwing out the Song Dynasty, and Hong Wu got a little nervous that this guy was too strong. And so they brought him in, and they involved 15,000 persons in the trial. That's his witnesses and everything. I mean, it was a huge, huge undertaking. Uh, also, after this, he created something that was very, very interesting, and this is the guards with brocade uniforms. It's a secret police. Again, uh, you know, as we look at the communists with their secret police, is it any wonder that they went ahead and did this? Because you're going to see secret police right through to the communists. Something that is essentially culturally uh, connected to how you govern, which is a little bit frightening. Because what do you think the chances are they'll get rid of a secret police if they've been doing it back since 1380? Not much. Uh, then they held purges, where a number of officials were executed for irregularities and high treason. Several years ago, President Xi purged a whole slew of officials for corruption, which is irregularities. So again, purges, mass purges, are nothing new. Nothing new. On the left, there's a dish with an imperial dragon. Now, what makes an imperial dragon interesting, I'll use my cursor, is one, two, three, four, five claws. If you get a Chinese piece from this time, either Ming or Qing, Qing is the next dynasty, with five claws, that was an imperial possession because everyone else was not allowed to own anything with five claws. So, despotism. Hong Wu suppressed the government apparatus. What did he do? He placed everything right under him. Well, that is not unusual either for leaders. If you take a look at Mao Zedong, he had the party, he had the government, he had the army all under him. Deng Xiaoping, essentially the same thing. He used a couple of folks who didn't do anything other than whatever he told them but he basically put all three under him. President Xi, who is now president for life, the present leader, has done the same thing. So again, we go all the way back to, you know, the 13, uh, 1400s, and this is how you govern in China. He reformed the military. How did he do that? He took greater control of it. What, does that mean reform? I don't know. He seemed to think so. He's viewed as a hero until the end of the dynasty when the Qings took over. He restored prosperity, which is good. He increased their power and prestige abroad and reformed the institutions, you know, to the way he liked them. However, there's some negatives. <coughs> it created a mistrust of the central government and its agents, kind of like uh, Fiddle Around the Roof, God bless the czar, you keep him away from us. Same type thing. Tendency to centralize under a leader in an authoritarian way. Secret government, that's secret police, kind of like the Star Chamber in England. Compromises and expediency based upon a small bureaucracy and the reliance on the local gentry to collect the taxes. That's a real weakness. Okay. On the left, you've got a censor. 
in the form of a mythical beast. It's kind of cute. Uh, very, very familiar uh, type of pottery. Uh, done quite a bit. All right. What are some things that distinguish the Ming Dynasty? Well, one of those inventions. Uh, the the Yungle Encyclopedia is probably the first comprehensive encyclopedia in the world. And it was made possible because of printing. And that'll be it's the next slide, but I'll tell you a little bit about it. See, there's two colors. That's the thing that made it very, very different and special. Two color printing. Uh, and they use wood blocks and they use movable type. Now, movable type was invented by the Chinese somewhere between 990 and 1051 AD. What were we doing in our culture? <laughs> About 1000 AD, certainly not messing around with books. It was the middle of the dark ages. Okay. The next one's kind of interesting the bristle toothbrush. Little did you realize your toothbrush is a creation of the Ming Dynasty. Pretty neat, huh? So at any rate, they mass produced them a little later, around 1780. And that's interesting because we introduced our first nylon one in 1938, so we're a little bit behind them. People used to use all sorts of interesting things to brush their teeth before the nylon toothbrush in our country, our, our own forebearers. And finally, the Ho Chong gun Use gunpowder and it shoots a projectile. Eventually, they replaced bamboo with bronze. And they were the first ones with bronze cannons. The only problem is they decided they really didn't want them. But we'll get to that in a second. The treasure fleets are famed. Uh, the Ming Dynasty basically sent folks. Can you see my cursor on here? If I move it, does that show up? Good. Yes. All right. Yes. They moved basically, obviously, from the China coast all the way around. And if you go past India, they made it into Arabia. Uh, what's, what's now Saudi Arabia? Uh, India, Borneo, Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, Japan, all over, Korea. And they, they took their fleets all over. Now, what were their fleets like? Well, uh, we'll get to that in a second. But the point is that generally, they were led by eunuchs. Folks have been castrated. Uh, that's kind of what they did. Um, Yong Le is the famous one. Uh, he demonstrated that Chinese had technical superiority over the Europeans. The Spanish and Portuguese didn't even try to mount long expeditions until the end of the same century. This is the 1400s, 15th century. They sailed as far as Mozambique, Africa, Jeddah, Hormoz, India, Sumatra, Java, Japan. Okay. Let's get an idea of what a Chinese fleet was like. Zheng He's fleet carried 27,000 people on 62 large ships. The longest was 440 feet long. Folks, a uh, football field is 300 feet, right? 100 yards, 440, football field and a third long. That's a big ship. Uh, they might have several decks and up to nine masts. And you can see that down here in this picture of what they believe one looked like. Uh, and right below is a, is a later European ship, like the kind that came to the Americas. Uh, historians were skeptical about the size of the ships. They didn't believe them until 1962, when on the Yangtze Riverfront, they found a buried wooden timber that was 36 feet long, originally a steering post, beside a massive rudder, and figured out that it was the right size for a ship that was 540 to 600 feet in length. Can you imagine? That's two football fields almost. So at any rate, that, and it was the right age, it was 600 years old. So they came to the conclusion it must have been from one of Zhong He's ships, massive ships. Now, 
Ebery, in his book, concludes that unlike later European expeditions, the Chinese used it to try to get people into a foreign Ming tributary system, be dependent upon the Mings. Now, remember the movie we saw last week at the beginning, One Belt, One Road, where the Chinese are getting out and just building roads and all over the place? It's essentially similar because those folks who take the loans out with the Chinese will have to pay them back, which means they will be able to a degree, they hope, to control them. So very similar. And again, I, I know so many things in this history come from way back here and before. Garnet states the expeditions were mounted to fulfill a combination of purposes, military, diplomatic, prestige, and economic enterprises, because they basically filled the court with all sorts of exotic and luxury items. Now, his expedition marked the end of a marine era for China. Why? Because the government decided they weren't going to do it anymore. And by the 1470s, they destroyed all the records of what he did. On purpose, they destroyed them. By 1525, the entire fleets of 3,500 ships had either been burned at their docks or left to rot. They made a conscious decision to go from the world's premier maritime power to not being a power at all on the seas. Why? Well, first of all, they were distracted because they had continuing battles with the Mongols up on their western border, northern western border. Uh, court officials didn't believe that the fleets were cost efficient. In other words, they weren't making enough profit. Uh, Angus Deaton argues the Chinese scrapped the fleet to attempt to control foreign trade. Now that sounds strange, but what they would basically do is at this point, they would allow so many ships a year in, or in the case of some of the countries, in 10 years, they'd allow like a ship or two in, and that was it. They, they could control foreign trade. And finally, uh, it's believed that the court officials became alarmed because there was a new Chinese merchant class, the middle class, if you view it in, in our terms. And that didn't fit very well with the nobility on the top and peasants below. The middle class, they didn't know what to do with them. Did they allow them to have some say in what went on or not? And those types, they could only cause them problems in their view. And this is a monument to Zheng He. Of course, they know exactly what he looked like. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a monument to him in Malaysia of all places. Uh, they withdrew from the seas. What were the results? China turned in on itself. This is something that they've done repeatedly through their history. They'll go out, try things, and then if they're not satisfied with how it works, they turn in on themselves and try to shut the rest of the world out. Uh, they had security concerns. Pirates, smugglers, maritime restrictions were oppressive. Uh, for their trading partners. And here's, here's one trading deal that you can see that had to cause some problems. The Chinese only allowed the Japanese to bring two ships in each decade. Can you imagine? But yet the Chinese ships are in Japan all the time. So they're controlling what's paid for everything that leaves or enters Japan. So obviously the Japanese were not thrilled. So eventually they just it caused more problems than it was worth to the to them. Okay, another thing is the Great Wall. Now the Great Wall was there already. However, they reconstructed it to make it better because the Mongols continued to attack them. Remember, they took out the Song Dynasty, which was a Mongol dynasty. Their relatives who were Mongols were not thrilled by, by the fact that they didn't control China anymore. In other words, the Mongol Empire shrank when these guys took China over. So they continually attacked them. Um, now, here's an interesting sidelight in history that I think is kind of interesting. The Mongols captured uh, the uh, Yingzong Emperor. Okay? Rather than bargain with the Mongols over ransom, they just installed the Ming's a new emperor. Said the heck with him. He's not worth it. 
not exactly a, a thrill. He must have been a beaut, is all I can say. Uh, now, the officials continually argued in terms of the Mongols, should we trade with them or should we have no contact at all? And, and frankly, they really never came to a conclusion. Stuff came in, stuff left, and they didn't really control everything. Okay. Decline of the, Mon the Ming Dynasty. The eunuchs were very responsible for things going to pot, so to speak. Within uh, about 50 years of the establishment of the dynasty, eunuchs controlled the military, foreign trade, and relations, the imperial workshops, and the secret police. So if you wanted to be an official in any of those areas, you had to have been uh, made into a eunuch. Um, Eventually, they established a privy council, which the eunuchs controlled. And so what happened was they replaced those organs of government that normally existed. The eunuchs took control of everything. And the privy council ran the country with the emperor essentially fronting them. When you get a situation where the emperor is a front man for somebody else, you've basically got a dynasty that's in decline. Uh, many eunuchs were corrupt and had virtually unlimited power. They were largely recruited from uh, northern China. Uh, this created a problem with the career bureaucracy, so to speak, which was educated from a reasonably high social level and largely from middle and southern China. Now, this would be the area where they recruited the uh, eunuchs. This down here was the area where all the career people came from. Okay, so you know, China is almost a continent in size. I mean, you figure the folks up here are wheat eaters, the folks down here are, are rice eaters. I mean, there's very, I mean, you know, just using that as an example of the difference, uh, they didn't have much in common with each other. Uh, so these guys, uh, the eunuchs, distrust the official bureaucracy, and as a result, they moved the capital from Nanjing, which is on the Yangtze River, okay, up to Beijing, which is on, isn't really on anything much. It's on a large creek. So all the trading obviously occurred between Guangzhou and Hong Kong and Shanghai before they had a capital that was essentially near at all. Now they had a capital was nowhere near what was going on in terms of trade and, and most of the things that you know, were manufactured and such. So what happened was at this point, uh, the, the Ming Dynasty emperors and their eunuch bureaucracy lost touch with most of the country. There were a number of scandals involving eunuchs in mining and uh, basically tax collection where the taxes got collected, the eunuch kept it and didn't go into uh, government coffers. Why did the dynasty end in particular? Well, first of all, there was a financial crisis. They had wars with Japan and Korea, which they lost, uh, with the Mongols in the Northwest, which they had trouble with. That's the reason they had a wall. Huge allowances were paid to members of the imperial family. They constructed some of the most monumental tombs in history. Here's one on the right. And this is the Emperor Wan Li's tomb, the Dingling in Beijing. It's still there. But it's a monstrosity. And then uh, silver flow into China stopped when the J Japan refused to allow the China traders from Macau into Nagasaki. And then, uh, just as a sidelight, there were riots that killed 20,000 Chinese and Spanish Manila. Lots of things going on. Ming's raised taxes, put in commercial taxes, raised the uh, taxes on the farmers, taxes on using the Grand Canal and the Yangtze Rivers to move things. Epidemics, they had a bad epidemic of smallpox. And the government was relying on food, uh, the farmers for food and taxes, and the farmers were all dying. 
or very sick. Finally, rebellions, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But there were, uh, for instance, uh, the Yellow River Dykes uh, Rebellion killed several hundred thousand people in Beijing. They moved into Beijing and killed them. Uh, it was just massive. So these are the things going on. So they failed to govern efficiently, to discover how to raise money to support the empire, empire in, a, in a way that made sense, to protect the people again from the rest of the world, they turned in, and to take advantage of leadership and technology and naval prowess, prowess, to win the loyalty of the population, and that's the show trials, the secret police, torture killing, and to establish a viable trade with other countries. So as a result, uh, they were a pushover at the end. And that we'll get to, uh, what I want to do now is uh, take a five minute break and we'll do the Qing Dynasty. So thank you and we'll be back in five minutes. How's that? Um, anybody want to ask any questions at this point? What was the logic in using the Unix in the Navy? Um, basically the Unix came to prominence because there were Unix in the household and the emperors relied upon them more and more, and they trusted them early on. And as a result, at the time when the fleets were going out, one of the most able men that the emperor could find was this eunuch. Plus, he, he trusted the eunuch because the eunuch hopefully would you know, bring back everything he collected and not pocket a whole bunch. So that it, it was a position of trust initially. By the end, Obviously, they blew the trust out. Yeah. Anything else? Is that good? Yeah. Nancy? I had a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Was how about the epidemic, um, the pandemic in thirteen, like the dark? Did it start there in China? In the thirteen hundreds. I don't know. I, don't know. Uh, I only really uh, concentrate on the type of history when I teach this that ties into. China today. And okay. so the epidemic makes sense to talk about smallpox because it brings the uh, Ming Dynasty to an end, it brings in the Qings. But as far as going over everything that happened, we could do a semester. <laughs> you know, Thank you. Know. Okay, sorry. Question here? Yeah. Uh, again, on Unix, what, where did they come from? How, what was the process? Were there schools that created Unix? Uh, at what age were they unicized or whatever you call it? They were, they were generally more about like, where they came from, well, not just the north, but how socially they came about. Well, they would have been uh, children of farmers generally. And they probably, if it runs anything like I imagine it does, would have been, you know, if, if you've got a farm and you uh, want to keep it in one piece, you leave it to one son, which means now you've got to do something with second, third, and fourth sons. And I imagine one of those options, I mean, one obviously could go become a monk of some sort or, you know, teacher, uh, but you needed a place to put some of those kids. And so, yeah, they, 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 they basically give them up. Uh, or have them taken, I don't know which really. And uh, they were taken in, in school, yes. And they were uh, castrated pretty early because you don't want to do that too late. Uh, so that they were done when they were children, young children, yeah. Does that answer? Uh, I mean, it's, I, I, it's, a, it's a, essentially a generic answer because I think there were lots of different ways, but mostly it would have been, uh, being that they came from the farming class, they probably would have been, you know, uh, excess kids well that's a good answer uh, but what is was there a specific process a recruiting school if you oh yeah they, they were school eunuch you would go to a particular place absolutely uh, I don't think there's any question about that but they made sure because th these guys were going to be running uh, but by the time it was over they were running the empire so obviously they were well schooled uh, I can't imagine they wouldn't be yeah now that's supposition, but I'm certain it's, it, it's, it's accurate. You, you don't get, uh, 
people who can run, you know, the tax structure and the military and this and that without educating them. Plus, they've got all these educated people working for them. So, I mean, obviously, they've got to have some idea what's going on. But apparently, there are no records of schools for eunuchs or organ societies that uh, recruited them and promoted them. I don't know is an honest answer to that part of it. But I would assume, being that they had positions that required, you know, an enormous amount of knowledge, they had to have been schooled somehow. It would, it would, it would stand to reason that there would be schools for these kids. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Did, did the emperor have a harem? <laughs> uh, the emperors basically did whatever they wanted. If they wanted a whole bunch of uh, concubines, they had them, yes. Okay. <laughs> it's a funny one. All right, are we ready to start in again? It's about five minutes. All righty. We're going to talk about the uh, Manchu dynasty, the Qings. Qing, Q I N G, pronounced C H I N G to those of us in English. Where did the Ming Mings come from? Well, the Manchus basically came from Manchuria, which is Hailing Jiang in Jilin, those provinces. You see the Inner Mongolians and then the Outer Mongolians. Okay, but they are from right there. So uh, this is where they come from. The state was created, founded by the emperor who took the name Norhachi. Now, do you remember the little thing that was the ashes of Norhachi in the uh, Indiana Jones movie? The one where they have that big fight in the nightclub? Uh, well, at any rate, uh, this is the emperor they're talking about. Not the first emperor of China, but the first emperor of the Qing dynasty. Just admit it, somebody. Uh, the Manchus were not Han Chinese. So we go from a Mongolian Song Dynasty to a Han Chinese, that's Chinese Chinese, Ming Dynasty, and now we have a Manchu Dynasty. These are all different ethnic groups. Okay. Um, what did they do, the Manchus? They were supposedly a farming, grazing, and fishing people. Okay. All right, the beginnings. In 1616, Norhachi renounced his fealty to the Ming Dynasty. In other words, he said, I'm, I'm independent now. All men in subjugated areas by the Qing were ordered to adopt the Manchu hairstyle, the Q. See? Uh, that's where it originates. The Chinese did not have the Q before the Manchus came in. That was a Manchu. Well, we'll get to it, but it's a Manchu thing that indicates loyalty. They separated the populations. The Manchus did not want to mix with the Chinese. The Manchus were required to carry weapons in the beginning, and the Han Chinese were barred from carrying weapons. So that was a way of making sure that they had dominance. Okay, somebody here needs to be muted. There we go. Um, that was a way of creating a difference between the two groups in establishing that the Manchus were in charge and the Chinese were being ruled by them. The Qing beginnings. Nohachi's son, Hong Taiji, adopted Chinese institutions and made increasing use of Chinese generals who defected from the Ming and generals who came from the Mongols. Smart move. Think about it. Now he's basically got everybody in the areas he controls working for him. And ethnically, they're somewhat mixed, which is interesting. After 10 years of expansion, he declared that he now established the Qing dynasty, claiming sovereignty over China. What does Qing mean? It means pure. Now, if you ask the Han Chinese, if they considered the Manchus to be pure, they probably would have gone because they didn't like them for the most part. They viewed them as invaders, the same way they viewed the Mongols. 
And so now for the next couple hundred years, you'd have these folks running things. 1644, after a Chinese general who went into rebellion, two Ch big Chinese generals basically divided up the country. Excuse and, me. And, yes. Are we supposed to be seeing a, a, a screen besides you? Yes. Because I'm, I'm just seeing you. How about the rest of you? What do you see? I see Fine. the screen. I got screen. Screen. Text. I got text. Text, OK. Yeah, with the, uh, with the, you got text the book of art. Screen to the left. You probably, yeah, you're probably looking at the wrong screen, if that's the case. Let me know when it's corrected. And I'll go on. I guess I'll just go on. All right, so these two giant Chinese generals split up the country at the end of the Ming Dynasty. Chong Zun, the emperor, commits suicide. One of the generals lets the Chinese go around the wall. And then they, uh, the, uh, the Manchus rather, around the, the end of the wall. And in they come. They get to Beijing. And the first thing they do is they segregate the Chinese into the southern part of the city. They occupy the northern part of the city, which includes the palace and everything, of course. They replace the eunuchs with trusted Han Chinese from Liaodong. Liaodong is directly below. In fact, if we go back, Liaodong is right back here. And this is an area that they had some control of, parts of it. And so they had been there a while, and these Chinese were loyal to the Manchus. Right. Yeah. And then uh, they, when they got to Beijing, they gave everybody in Beijing, all males, 10 days to only have a queue. It's a bald head with a queue coming out. If at the end of 10 days you didn't have your hair cut correctly, they executed you. Very simple. Does that send a signal right away to the population? We're in charge and we're not putting up with anything. You better be good. It took them about 15 years to take over all of Man, Ming China. They had to go fight the other general and some other folks. And in fact, the Mings still in southern China had controlled cities and other small places, Ming cousins and such. But they basically they took the whole thing over in about 15 years. From uh, 1669 to 1795, which is what, 150 years about, there were only three emperors. And all of them were really strong. They were outstanding managers. They governed well. They uh, tried to temper their arbitrary power and concentrated on raising revenue, keeping the officials in line, and maintaining peace. This was kind of the, the golden age of the Qing dynasty. And, and may have been, for an awful lot of Chinese, until the 20th century, the best of all times. They really did a good job. They restored social order, restored Chinese gentry's place, present themselves as protectors of the cultural heritage and of the Manchu military leaders. And we're about to have some noise. Someone just, somebody just rang the doorbell and the dog just went nuts, of course. Good old Ernie. All right, so uh, they presented themselves to the Chinese, which is a real interesting thing, as the protectors of Chinese cultural heritage. Now, on the one hand, you have the Chinese who resent the fact that Manchus are ruling them. On the other hand, the Manchus are saying, but we protect your cultural heritage. We're, you know, make sure everything Chinese stays just the way it ought to be. It didn't quite work. But these rulers were so strong, the first three, that it didn't matter. Kangxi the first patronized uh, literary that's the writers and painters and all those folks, made efforts to induce prominent scholars to join the government. He ensured that bannermen dominated the government. Now, what's a bannerman? Well, when they came in, there were three groups of bannermen. They were, everybody who was Manchu was, a, was in a banner. Uh, it's, it's like a super clan, so to speak, but not, necess not based on re being relatives, but based upon geography or whatever. Uh, 
by the time they took China over, they, there were eight banners of Manchus and eight banners of loyal Chinese. And everyone was assigned to a banner. So you would so it'd be as if you were assigned to Florida. Someone else is assigned to Maryland. Uh, not geographically, but you know, is what you identify as. He was deeply interested in math, science, and mechanical devices. And here's a Qing dynasty. Uh, you'll notice this, the, it's not quite as fine as, as the Ming dynasty before it for some reason, but uh, that, that's generally what everybody's noticed about the Qing art. And that's, that's what I have here at home, some Qing art. But it's not as good as the Ming, but who, nobody can afford the Ming. It's very expensive. Um, how the Ming worked. I, I picked one situation that I think will explain how they thought. First of all, when the Jesuit missionaries first came to court, uh, they were accepted. Uh, they were accepted because they had... Uh, done a better job of predicting some astro uh, astronomy type things. I think it was uh, maybe a, uh, it escapes me. This is a senior moment, guys. Um, an eclipse, eclipse, pardon? Dave? Yeah. I thought it was a comet, but you're right. Yeah, a comet, I, I think you're right now that you say that. They predicted the thing and uh, the Chinese, uh, astronomers were unable to do so. So they said, ah, these guys are good. So they let them in. In 1692, they issue an edict saying that Christian converts are allowed as long as they continue to perform ancestral rites. Now, where does this all come from? Folks, this is so far back in Chinese history, it's not funny, the veneration of ancestors. So they couldn't imagine anybody not doing this. And these guys didn't want to do it. So so, when the Pope Ligat forbade them from doing so, they're, they're Christians that they had converted, they issued an edict, uh, re, you know, reversing the first one, and they weren't allowed to pra practice unless they, you know, accepted uh, ancestor worship. Uh, we call it ancestor worship, it's veneration, really. And finally, he ordered the expulsion of the missionaries who didn't support his stance. Some of them obviously did. Some didn't. But they were, they were in control. Next one, your uh, son, Yong Jong. Now, he curbed the military power of the Manchu aristocracy. It had gotten pretty strong. He tightened control over the civil bureaucracy. Again, concentrating power in his own hands, obviously. His main efforts were in the area of state finances, broad public, uh, public levies for the patchwork of taxes and fees inherited from the Ming. So again, they're, you know, they're, they're getting this tax base that's secure. And he abolished the pre-existing hereditary servile status and legally emancipated members of various local dominion uh, castes. In other words, he'd be freed the slaves, so to speak, okay? And on the right uh, is a very, very nice dish, porcelain, uh, with an underglaze of cobalt blue. Very nice, that's a real, real fine. These uh, pictures are all from the uh, Metropolitan Museum of New York, mostly. Uh, during uh, the third Qin Long's reign, so 1736, 1795, the government ran a fiscal surplus. What does that mean? That means, that the farmers were able to farm without being interrupted, that there weren't any rebellions particularly, that everything was nice and calm. Unless it was calm with the tax structure they had, they could not even pay the bills, as the Ming's found out. Here the Qing's managed to have things be, uh, to use the uh, old comedian work, copacetic. Uh, what was his day like? In the morning, he tended to the affairs of state. In the afternoon, he devoted his time to reading, painting, and writing. He wrote over 42,000 poems, and of course, they saved every one, and inscribed his poetry on hundreds of masterpieces of painting and calligraphy. Now, this thing about collecting his works and having them pushed out to everyone, those of you who can see me, 
See this? It's a little red book. It's Mao's little red book. He did somewhat the same thing. He got his philosophy out in a little red book. This guy got his philosophy out in his poems. Uh, he was his desire was to be remembered as a sage emperor, and I think, uh, frankly, he succeeded. Uh, other interesting things about him: he visited his mother each day and ensured her every comfort. He crushed now the, the dark side. If you did something that was anti-Manchu, you weren't going to survive. It was absolutely my way, the highway. Uh, he conducted a literary inquisition that destroyed any writings that even hinted of anti-Manchu sentiments. Now, uh, you know, some of the folks who were apologists for him because most of what he did was really good say, well, he, these late actions, the last couple that he did, were due to have, his having been senile at the end of his uh, reign. I don't know. I wasn't there. So at any rate, uh, there we go. On the right, you've got a nice uh, covered ewer somewhere between 64, uh, 1644 and 83. It's porcelain in enamels on the biscuit. You know, it's a rather pretty one. Storks. Storks were very popular on their stuff. Horses less so. All right, the conquests and dominations of the Qing dynasty. If you look, you'll see here's your basic Ming China in the purple. In the pink up here, Manchuria, this is the area that uh, Manchuria, this is the area that came to them when the Manchus from Manchuria took over. Plus, they also took Inner Mongolia. Here's the Great War. By taking Inner Mongolia, what happened? No more raids. That's the end of the, uh, the Mongols giving them a problem. Mongols are pushed out to outer Mongolia for the most part, at least the unfriendly ones. The ones that are left here, and I'm sure there's lo there were loads of them decided they'd rather switch than fight, so to speak. What else did they take? They took this area out here, which nobody really had claimed to be. And what's interesting about this group is it's Muslim, almost entirely. Down here, for the first time, they took Tibet. This is going to come back to bite Tibet in the 1950s. When Tibet was an independent country, and the Chinese uh, communists will come in and grab it. And uh, where did they have a lot of influence? Nepal, Burma, Siam, Laos, these areas, Vietnam, known then as Tonkin. And again, conquest and domination. I want to show you the map before I showed you the, the countries written out, because it means more. But they basically dominated the entire region, including Korea. Uh, Tibet and the Muslim areas were allowed their own religious leaders. Obviously, in Tibet, you had you know, uh, Buddhists and the Muslim areas had Muslim. And they did not have to wear the Manchu cube. Uh, now they ran into a, a strong friction with the Russians. In fact, uh, there, were, there were conflicts every now and then with the Russians, which is something that, again, has continued to the modern day. The plate here is the uh, three figures from a novel, uh, somewhere around 1700. And it's very nice, nicely done. Qing social values. Now, some of these values, as the dynasty goes on, we're past the three, and we're a little bit further on. It talks about how they felt that the Ming fell due to their moral laxness. laxness. And uh, the laxness undermined the Ming commitment to duty and ethical leadership. Well, I mean, sure, uh, winners make the history. Uh, reassured, uh, asserted uh, uh, Jushi, that's the Confucius view that everyone is evil unless they're enculturated in a way that makes them good. And uh, that they said that uh, there needed to be a very uh, pronounced structure of laws telling everybody what to do. And they, and they put them in. Uh, there were laws against deviant behavior. 
against uh, the literary, the folks who were uh, the, the writers and painters, turned against drama and fictional writing and intended to write fact and to paint things that were uh, real. Um, and there was a great emphasis on the purity of women. Uh, see this is back here? This is a monument to a widow who refused to remarry. There were memorial arches all through China, and there still are those that the Cultural Revolution didn't destroy, that honor these women who remained widows. God knows why that was considered, you know, morally wonderful, but it was. Every society has its own quirks. Uh, many Confucians turned to early texts to free themselves from Buddhist and Taoist ideas. So we're trying to be good Confucians, and I spelled it wrong there. How do you like that? Spell check didn't catch it. Uh, finally, they venerated, and this is really weird, Han art. Now, the Hans ruled from 206 BC to 220 AD. And so they copied the styles of the Hans. What does it represent? It represents almost a turning back in views of things, but it also represents a foreign rulership trying valiantly, I suppose you'd use the word, to get everyone to believe that this is what China is and that we're part of it, when in fact they weren't. Manchus had nothing to do with China at that time. But anyway. Trade with the Europeans. This is when things began to fall apart for the Manx. Uh, they traded uh, with the Europeans in South China, obviously in the late Ming period, in the 16th century with the Spanish and Portuguese. Now, they were replaced by the Dutch and then the British. And I mean, it's basically it's European history, right? I mean, Spain and Portugal were big, then the Dutch were big, and then the British took over. After 1759, the British East India Company traded exclusively in Canton, today's Guangzhou, with the Kohong, the Chinese merchant guild there. And that was the only way that he could trade. They had a little enclave where they were allowed to live for a few weeks each year. And they had to leave when they were done trading with these Kohong. And the only people they were allowed to trade with were these Chinese guild members. So it was a very, very controlled means. And again, same thing as Ming Dynasty. Now you've got the Qings turning in and trying to control all trade. Uh, at any rate, uh, a lot of them went to Macau the rest of the year because they didn't want to travel all the way back to England, which was a dangerous trip. Or they did return to Britain. Uh, trade grew enormously. For instance, English tea imports were five chests in 1684, five chests. And then by 1720, 400,000 pounds and 23 million pounds by 1800. I mean, if you drew that on the graph, the graph is essentially going straight up at the end. It starts off horizontal and it's vertical before you finish, don't it? So at any rate, the Brits purchased one seventh by 1800 of all the tea produced in China. And the Brits were also getting China out of India. They, they definitely drank a lot of tea. How'd they pay for it? Silver, this is a problem. It's a lot of silver. Where the Portuguese and Spanish had admired Chinese society by 1800, most European and intellectuals and everybody else, frankly, denigrated the lack of liberties and the progress there. The British began to demand changes in how trade was accomplished. They sent an ambassador, Lord George, the king's cousin, to negotiate with, with uh, Qianlong in 1793. First of all, they wouldn't receive him in court because he would not kowtow. You know, that's where you go down and your head touching the floor. So at any rate, he wouldn't kowtow. They finally hit an arrangement where he was able to meet the emperor at the emperor's summer retreat. In other words, while he was on vacation, so to speak. And there he could do it informally. But a formal meeting never occurred. Now, what did McCartney learn from this? 
the king's cousin. He learned the Chinese weren't prepared for war, uh, that they weren't interested in progress, and they still fought with, and I quote from him, bows and arrows. That's what he saw. He sent a letter, uh, the, the emperor now sends a letter to the king of Great Britain. You love this one. We possess all things. I set no value on objects strange or ingenious, and I have no use for your country's manufacturers. I feel like that. What are we looking at? We're looking at somebody who's just kind of cut himself off, cut his country off, and say, things may be better, but we don't want them because we think we're the best thing can be. Now, this is a picture in opium again, just for what it's worth. Opium had long been used in China as a drug, for example, uh, for treatment of diarrhea. And, and I remember when I first went to India, and I get a prescription, and lo and behold, what is it? It's a bottle of opium. And I went, whoa. I ditched it and bought, you know, those little pills you take. In the 17th century, smoking it, uh, you mixed it with tobacco. And they, you know, they, they used that. It spread north from Southeast Asia. Uh, it was used a lot in uh, Laos and Vietnam. Some, uh, uh, in the 18th century, 1700s, they found a way to refine the opium so it could be smoked alone in a pipe into powder. Some smoked simply for its narcotic effects, but many recently used it to relieve physical or emotional pain and to make physically difficult work easier. Now, in Hong Kong years ago, the porters who were carrying heavy burdens all over Hong Kong, they used cocaine that way. They take cocaine through the day and it made them strong enough to, to, to lug stuff that they couldn't normally lug. What was the result of it? They died young, but they used it. Following the British conquest of India, the Brits invested massively in the manufacture and distribution of opium. And they saw its sale as a way of balancing payments with China. In other words, we'll ship the Chinese opium for tea, et cetera. Because they've been losing all this silver, and the Brits had a big trade deficit with China. Chinese authorities became concerned when government clerks, imperial clansmen, and eunuchs at court became opium addicts. In 1800, they banned the importation and domestic production of opium. In 1813, smoking opium was, because it continued, obviously, smoke, it was smuggled in. Smoking opium was outlawed and punishable by 100 blows and wearing a, a wooden collar from them. The British found, obviously, Chinese smugglers eager, eager to engage in the business because it was profitable. And once it was in, gangs paid off the police and officials to ignore the fact they were running these opium dens. The outflow of silver from China to pay for the opium, now all of a sudden they're paying more. Before they were taking the silver in, now they're shelling the silver out. Here's how it grew. It grew from the equivalent of $70 million in 1820s to $315 million in the 1830s. It's a real problem. So what did they do? Remember when the Brits had the balance of payment problem, they sent their, the king's cousin. The Chinese now sent uh, Lin Zhu uh, to Guangzhou to compel foreign traders to stop the importation of opium. They confiscated pipes, opium stores, and arrested 1,600 Chinese. They threatened to execute the heads of the Kohong, who were involved in the smuggling too, obviously. Barricade the foreigners in their factories to force the turnover of opium. The British did agree to abolish the East India Company, and they appointed a British superintendent. He collected the British opium and turned it over to, to Lin. Lin decreed that only traders who agreed not to deal in opium would be allowed to trade in Guangzhou, Canton. Uh, Lin pressured the Portuguese to expel the British traders from Macau. Not, it didn't happen. Among others who pressured for war, William Jardine. You've heard of Jardine, Matheson and Company? Very, very, very well known. Big, big, uh, uh, 
building down by the Chinese uh, waterfront in Hong Kong, uh, when I was there at least, uh, they, they may not be there anymore, uh, probably the biggest trader in the world at that time. He goes back and pressures for war. Needless to say, the British government's listening to him. A British expeditionary force now sails from India in 1840, 16 warships and 31 other vessels. Before the war's end, two years later, the British seized Ningbo, Tianjin, Shanghai, and finally they were marching on Nanjing. And the Chinese recognized they had no choice but to sue for peace. In other words, they creamed the Chinese. What's the result? The British get Hong Kong for 100 years, or whatever. The Kohang in Guangzhou was abolished. So now they can trade with anybody that they meet in Canton. Canton, Xiamen, Fuzhou, Ningbo, and Shanghai are all, all become open treaty, treaty ports. Uh, for instance, uh, some of them were wound up eventually being run by the Germans, some of them were run by the French, the Brits. I don't think we actually had a port, but we traded there too. An indemnity was paid by China of 21 million ounces of silver. In other words, they got back a lot of that silver that they paid to the Chinese. 5% tariff to the Brits. Brit subjects were answerable only to British law. And finally, if another country received a privilege in China, the Brits were extended that privilege automatically. It pays to be the winner, doesn't it? Ramifications. For the rest of the 19th century, China was subjected to many unequal treaties. If you take a look at this map, you will see the areas. Uh, you got German, British, French, Japanese, Russian. The Russians had this area, the Japanese got this area, the French got this area near the French Indonesia, uh, Indochina rather, Brits had this, and uh, Japanese also had that. So Japanese got Taiwan. So at any rate, what they did basically was uh, the Brits got this area, you know, adjacent to India. So all of a sudden, they didn't own Tibet anymore. Pretty nasty, huh? So now they've got their country split into bits with all these pieces, essentially run by other countries. China couldn't set its own tariffs. Eventually, it had to start appointing European officials to handle a collection of tariffs, those it could set. In 1860, a French, uh, Anglo-French expedition occupied Beijing for a month to force the acceptance of new treaties that raised the number of uh, treaty ports. Remember, there were five or six in the beginning, now to 14. Essentially, the coastal cities were farm dominated. Long leases were signed. And again, the reason I hedged on the 100 years is because the 100 years really was from when this was done, not from the original scene of Hong Kong. Um, and essentially, the Europeans had sovereignty over most of the coast, Chinese coast. The end of the century, it's estimated that 10% of the Chinese population smoked opium, and a third to a half were addicted of those people. So you've got up to 15 million opium addicts in China. Though the Chinese attempted to modernize, the Japanese did at the time, they were unable to do so. Why? Due to the unequal uh, treaties that they had with the Europeans, for the most part plus their own conservative views, trying to pull in, retain what they have. Whereas the Japanese got good ideas from all over the place. Uh, internal rebellions. Uh, there were internal conflicts. That, and these, frankly, posed greater threats, threats than even the Europeans did. Hard to believe. 13, 1813, the eight trigrams managed to penetrate the forbidden city in Beijing. And here they killed 70,000 people in Beijing. Uh, in the Taiping Rebellion, which is the major one, it was a peasant rebellion. <laughs> it was aided by the Christian missionaries. He taught love. Uh, spread over 16 provinces, held Yanjing for over 10 years. 600 cities were destroyed. It is estimated 20 million people were killed in the Taiping Rebellion. Can you imagine? And I'm sorry about my remark about the missionaries, but I mean, I just somehow can't imagine anybody who's 
practices the type of Christianity we have, <laughs> inciting people to, you know, bloody rebellion. That's just beyond me. But, uh, armies necessary to put down the rebellions essentially acted autonomously. They collected their own taxes and acted outside the control of the central government. So now that money's not going back to Qing's in Beijing, it's staying with the generals. What does that remind you of? These folks are the prototypes for the warlords in the 20th century. Again, much of what you see in the 20th century, there's nothing new. It's all things that have been done before, just put together a little differently. All right, Japan versus China. Why were they different? In 1850, Japan decided to become a modern country. It's pretty late, actually. And they were going to be able to defend themselves against the Western powers. First thing they did was they, they scaled things back to a constitutional monarchy. They eliminated the privileges of the old ruling classes. They established new and modern industries. They established a universal school system that churned out men. Sorry about that. Uh, tell everybody else to turn their phones off and I left my own. Uh, established a universal school system that churned out people capable of staffing a modern army and navy. In other words, they took the old ideas and just, for the most part, dumped a lot of them. Now, what did they retain? They retained you know, the religious beliefs. They retain their, you know, strong family structure. The things that truly matter to them as people they retained. But they realized they had to lay over a modern facade. So the traditional part of their culture they kept, but they adopted a new modern part that would make them able to compete in the world. Now, what's that like? That's like modern Japan, Korea, Vietnam, uh, after the World War II and after uh, our war in Vietnam, these countries all realized they had to modernize. And so they're still, you know, the core of their existence is still there. The religious beliefs for the most part, their uh, family structure, things that truly matter on an individual and, and family basis. But over the top, they've done what they know they have to do to succeed. And that, that, that really matters a lot. All right, so they became an imperial power, the Japanese did, and they claimed uh, Ryujis Islands, which had long been a tributary of China. They forced Korea to open trade. China wasn't able to stop them. And China, they, China tried to stop them. They fought the Japanese and got their butts kicked. Okay, here's a picture down here showing battles between the Japanese and the Chinese. Notice the Japanese are attired in modern costumes, uniforms. They've got modern weapons. And the Chinese are there with their lances and whatever, literally getting annihilated. Uh, that reflects it as well as anything. It's a, uh, that was a woodcut done at, the, at that time. It's a Japanese woodcut. Okay. The end. The Empress Dowager Cixi. There's her photograph. I mean, there she is. She was regent from 1861 to 1898 when things really went downhill. Her two young emperors, Tongzhi and Guangzhou. Guangzhou is interesting because, because, well, the first one died at 18. The second one was not allowed uh, to rule by her until he was 23 years old, and she didn't like him. She was selfish, ignorant, and played reactionaries off against reformers. Um, now, obviously, it's hyped up, but there's a movie called 55 Days at Peking. Uh, which is worth looking at if you want to get a feel for her era. Some of the historical stuff is fabricated, obviously, by the screenwriters. But overall, it talks about the Kohongs and it talks about her and her court and her generals. That stuff is reasonably accurate. 
Uh, so it's, it, it would be a good movie to take a look at to get a feel for the end of the Qing dynasty. So at any rate, it, it, but it didn't actually end when she died. It ended a little later. All right, so she was selfish ignorant. We talked and she seemed to support. All right. In 1898, uh, Guangzhou attempted reforms and uh, that were suggested by Confucian scholars in education, commerce, government, and the military. See, they waited too long. The Japanese did it in 1850 when it was still a salvageable situation with the Europeans. By 1900, it's gone. And that's when they're trying. After several months, she locks him up. That's the emperor she has locked up because she controls the folks in the house with it. And they captured and executed most of the folks who had advocated the reforms. Now, I, this is my remark on the bottom, and I think it's true. See, she holds a similar place in history to Kaiser Wilhelm in Germany and Tsar Nicholas in Russia, in that she set in motion the collapse of an empire and the resulting instability. What do you get after that eventually? Well, in Germany, you got just a, just a mess till Hitler came along. In Russia, you get Stalin, you know, Lenin and then Stalin. And finally, in China, you get the Republic and then Mao. And I believe that if they had anybody who was reasonably competent, they could have done a much, much better job than was, was done by her. The Boxer Rebellion, this is basically the end. It's initiated by the Harmonious Fists. That's a secret society that combined martial arts with a belief in special powers that they would possess. They held a very uh, xenophobic, you know, uh, we're good and everybody else is bad view. Uh, the China's ills were a result of evil foreigners, okay, especially missionaries. Mm -hmm. In 1898, they emerged in Shandong province as they seized and destroyed foreign missionary property and killed the missionaries and the Christian converts, anybody they could find. It attracted peasants, discharged soldiers, canal boat tractors, and salt smugglers. Now it's just at the bottom. In June 1900, the boxers in Beijing and Tianjin began to harass and then kill foreigners and Christian converts. Shishi uh, advocated, but finally decided to, equivocated rather, but finally decided to support the boxers. Big mistake. She believed the boxers could be the solution to the foreign problem. So yeah, she's xenophobic too. That, that uh, had, you know, evaded uh, China. In other words, maybe that's just the solution that'll work. Needless to say, the Western powers prepared to fight. In June 1900, the boxers laid siege to the foreign legations in Beijing. Cixi issued a declaration of war, and here's what she said. The foreigners have been aggressive toward us, infringed on our territorial integrity, trampled our people under their feet. The common people suffer greatly at their hand, and each one of them is vengeful. Nice, huh? So at any rate, you got the Chinese uh, government essentially supporting this riffraff army. The boxers then attacked the mission compounds throughout China. What, so what's the result? 20,000 troops from a dozen nations marched from Tianjin, which they took right away, to Beijing, where they lifted the siege and looted the city. What does Cixi do? She flees with the emperor to Xi'an, which is out in the middle of nowhere, way west, okay? The end of the Qings. Okay, so now you get in 1905 constitutional reform. And my remark about it is it's way too little and way too late. Uh, the Guangxu Emperor dies. That's the one that she had locked up, who now is out, a day before Cixi dies. Cixi knew she was going to die. And therefore, it is rumored that uh, it should be she, or that he had been poisoned at her uh, order. She didn't want him surviving her because he was too much for the reforms. So now you get Puyi, who's the last 
Qing emperor at the age of two. He lasts till he's six, which point uh, he abdicates. Okay. They hold him in house arrest in the Forbidden City until 1924. Why? I have no idea. They just did. He resurfaces in 1932 as the emperor of Manchukuo, which is the Japanese run Manchuria, which they had invaded and taken. In 1945, he was captured by the Russians and imprisoned. Then he's returned to China and imprisoned. And finally, he's allowed out in 1959. So here he is as a child. Here he is as the emperor of Manchukuo, Manchukuo. And finally, he was released and worked as a gardener in a botanical park until he died in 1967. And there he is, finally able to just sit there, have a cigar and, or cigarette and relax by the side of the water near Beijing. And that is basically where things leave us. Next week, we're going to uh, do the nationalists and the Chinese takeover. And then the week after that, we're going to do really what the China, Chinese Communist Party did from the Great Leap Forward to the present. So at this point, are there any questions? Yes. Um... As you talk about the Boxer Rebellion, I was thinking so much of the Boston Tea Party. You know, <laughs> British against the Americans and Chinese against all those foreign powers. I, 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 am, I am from that part of the world. I'm from Malaysia. I was born there. Yeah. And so I kind of have a different view of things from Americans. So if I throw out a comment like this, it's because I was, I was raised there and educated in that area. So, Penny, let me let me ask you a question, Penny. Uh, sure. and you have to answer it if you don't want. Is your family Malaysian or are they overseas Chinese? Uh, they're not Chinese at all, though I do have a lot of Chinese in my background. My grandmother was from Thailand and my father was from uh, England. Okay. I mean, you would call wondered. Eurasian, but I was raised in Malaysia with a very, um, let's say, Eurasian Asian. Mm -hmm. And I had, and you, I don't know if you've ever been in Malaysia, but we had a a huge population of Chinese, oh, yeah. and many of them are my friends to this day. But the re reason I mention it, Penny, is if you take a country like Thailand, uh, uh -huh. Thailand yeah, for years problem. has been run by the military and the overseas Chinese community. Uh -huh. uh, they got the money, the military's yeah. got the might, sure. and they've managed to work together. And generally, if you look at most of the countries in that part of the world, that's kind of how, it, how it's worked out that uh, an awful lot of the Chinese have very much oh, to say yes. about it. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. and, and, but the flip is, the flip is that every so often in these countries, there are riots where the folks who are not Chinese kill the Chinese indiscriminately, particularly in Indonesia. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Is it, was that a uh, sufficient answer? But I, and I appreciate yes, yours. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? I can't believe it. We're done early. Last week I ran over. This week we're done early. That's excellent. Wonderful lectures. Very informative. Thanks. I, you know, I hope it helps a little bit. Uh, I try to tie as much as I can uh, to what's going on now because you begin, you'll, you're going to see when we get into to the Chinese communist stuff and the nationalists that much of what you've seen with the Ming's Qing's, with the philosophies way back, has a way of resurfacing again and again. Uh, most cultures are like that. Uh, look at, uh, in our culture, the, the, the British start off with the Magna Carta, right? You get the king doing things that the nobles don't like. So first you have this document that protects the nobility, doesn't do a damn thing for the rest of us, but nobody cares anymore. And then you've got, you know, some other things that happen and you've got uh, finally, uh, the, you know, the views that develop and you, they come over here to the United States and what do they do? We leave Britain again. In other words, we come up with this country that's all well, these freedoms and what do the British do? They adopt the same thing and, and it's the little kids. You look at a little kid and, and I think I said this uh, last week, 
in certain countries, you can tell a child not to do something and because they respect their elders, they don't do it. In our country, you got to explain to them why they shouldn't do it. And that's, that's it. It's something about that way of thinking it, uh, is infuriating it on the one hand and on the other hand, it makes them into better citizens eventually. So, I have a comment. Sir. Yes, I, the Boxer Rebellion reminds me a lot of uh, our Declaration of Independence and our independence from from Great Britain. I'm very much enjoying the lectures. Uh, it's just what I what I need about this time. I love history, and you're doing a great job. Thank you, uh, Lynn. One thing, one one major difference between the Boxer Rebellion and and our uh, fight for independence in Britain. When we fought the British, for the most part, we had the same level of weapons that they did. Boxers. I mean, you know, that bows and arrows thing is really true. I mean, the British troops or other troops, the British, German, Japanese, U.S., a whole bunch of countries, French, uh, they came in and these folks would start charging them and they just lower the cannon and just blow a whole bunch of them away. Uh, they just didn't. And they had cannon, but they were no good. I mean, in, in the same way that ours were good. So, I mean, yeah. yeah. And then the influence of opium too that was interesting that's still a problem <laughs> well yeah uh i i don't know the answer i mean uh, and then this this you can relate to our own country is it a good idea to legalize marijuana uh i don't know i mean I I, afghanistan or you know yeah you see, the problem is, is that it depends on how they were using opium. I mean, originally it was used just like cocaine in the, in the Andes. It's used uh, to alleviate pain because people yes. have worked so hard. But then That's when right. it starts getting abused, like it does throughout the world right now, including the United States, then you have a whole different issue. You have also the whole uh, economic thing where you can make a lot of money from the opium like the British did. Well, so thought, the British were fighting with the Chinese so that they could take over the opium trade from the uh, from the Chinese. So it depends on which way you want to look at it. That's you know, absolutely who right. Who makes the money from whom? And and uh, at the at the base of it was something that was very very important for the livelihood and for the for the survival of people. Opium, also cocaine, but um, you know, right now what we have the opioids. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Um, forget the name of the pharmaceutical company, but uh, they're not going to, they don't exist anymore. They were bankrupted because of that. Oh, well, yeah. Whichever, right. You know, the other thing is religion too, Tom. I, I had the Jesuits. I'm a cradle Catholic, so I can say this, but you know what those Jesuits did all over the world, whether it was in China, whether it was in South America and Central America, they did such a job on the people there. But you know, in the name of God, in the name of Jesus. That is what's so fascinating about history. Well, so fascinating. About the in Jesuits, the name of Christ. About they, the thing with the Jesuits that I, I find so fascinating is that what they become is the intellectuals of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, and a lot of their views are far more what would be considered, I guess, liberal than uh, standard dogma in the church. And yet they were the ones who <laughs> to the Inquisition, all that good stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, well, I thank you all. Thank and, you, uh, thank you. Appreciate your attending, and I hope uh, to see you all next week. Oh, thank sure, sure. God, well, thank you. Be thank safe. You. Have a good week. Bye-bye now. Bye. 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 See you.